Well, good morning, folks. It is, it is a thrill to see you. We are looking at the book of Ephesians today. Yesterday, we, um, we have a lady uh, that we have become associated with whose home was condemned over in Pasadena by the city, and they're going to tear the city's going to tear it down in 60 days and for her and then send her this huge hunky bill. And um, we went to look at the house, and the house, uh, in my uh, uh, opinion, needs to come down because it really is in bad shape. It, it would cost far more to fix it than it would to tear it down and, and build another one. And she's living in an apartment, and, and, but she's still got stuff in the house that she liked to keep. And so the day one uh, Sunday school department, which is graduated college graduates who have good jobs teaching, and they they're kind of a different group. They're, they're, not, they're single, but they didn't work part of the singles ministry. They formed their own department. And they've been doing excellent. In fact, they're the group whenever I have a move where we have to move somebody from upstairs, climb steps, there's the, they're the ones I call. They've been so faithful. Well, they, they want to do some service projects, and so they've been helping me refurbish a house for a lady over in uh, Pasadena who for the last seven years has lived with absolutely no sheetrock on her walls in the house. And husband started the project and never got to it, and then he'd tear out more, and all the supplies were there, just never got finished. <clears throat> and then the husband's left the family, and so I've been teaching them how to hang sheetrock and how to float and tape. Let me tell you, some of these girls are good. They can flat hang that sheetrock and float and tape and build stud walls. And so I asked them to go over and help me. We went over and started a, an 8 by 16 shed, full height, 8 foot wall shed, over so that this lady could put store stuff in until the house came down and in a couple of weeks the house is going to come down and and then we're hoping to uh, help her get situated in a little different situation but the shed is built on skids so we can move it when they don't need it and it's a nice little investment well we had all these um, girls over there young women who are teachers and all that type of stuff over, and boy they started off good eight o'clock we didn't do anything with power tools except for a power saw Everything else was done by hand, no nail guns, so it'd be safe. And off they went. Bam, 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 bam. At 11.15, I noticed the girls were, bam, bam, bam. And the guys, they were, and I'm, I'm still going. I'm going, oh, come on, we can get this done. Another an hour and a half, two hours, we'll have this done. Let's get it done before we go home. And of course, those of y'all who work at Danbury with me, you know, it, noon would come and I'd say, I got one more thing it'd take till two. One more thing and we'll get it done. So I was purely expecting that. So by 11.30, they convinced me we needed to go eat lunch and go back this afternoon at 3. So I said, you sure you want to do that in the holiday? Why don't we wait till 6? Oh, no, we don't want to get into our nights. Let's do it at 3. I said, okay, well, I'll be there. So this afternoon, we'll be there at 3 working. Well, we went to lunch, and I was asking them about their, their teachers that they had in the department. And, and they were telling me who they'd have, who they'd had, and, and, and I asked them who they liked and everything and, and who they best responded to, and I was thrilled by that. And they had had one teacher that seemed to go, and, and they, they would take a verse and they would tear it apart. And they would tear that verse apart so long that by the time they got to the end of the verse, seven weeks down, they couldn't even remember what the first word in the verse was. You ever been there? Last time, I, and I thought about that, and I said to them, you know, <laughs> I, I'm at this point where I used to be one of these. I'd take the, ver of the passage, and I would tear it so far apart. In fact, the last time I did the book of Ephesians, it took a little over three years because I tore it all apart. And that's what we do with Ephesians for some reason. And I'm not there anymore. Now I back up and I say, you know, this was a letter. This is what this was. This was a letter to the church to be read and understood simply for what it is not digging down and trying to dig some rock and make it into a precious stone but take it as a whole and I, and I said to him you know I don't do that anymore I don't dig like that anymore because because if we can just learn the principles of what God is simply saying it is so simple and it really and truly guides us through everything and so as we fly through Ephesians, and virtually nobody flies through Ephesians, but as we fly through Ephesians in the next couple of weeks, including today, I want you to catch a glimpse of what 
Paul is saying to the church there in Ephesus. Now I want to remind you, this letter is written to the church in Ephesus about 62 to 64 A.D., somewhere around there. Paul's going to write two more letters that are going to end up at that church in Ephesus. Now do you remember what those two letters are? Come on folks, we just studied them. 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, because that's where we've just been. Paul has left Timothy in Ephesus for the purpose of evangelizing and getting the organization of the church in Ephesus accurate. He's left Titus another place. And he's got all these different people. He's put different places. And Timothy is in Ephesus. And so Paul writes to Ephesus, and then the next year he's going to write a letter to Timothy, and within the next year he's going to write a letter to Timothy again. And, he, and, and it's all got to do about what's going on in Ephesus. Now let me tell you, Ephesus was an incredible city in this day. This day was an incredible city. <clears throat> it was, uh, in, a, in the province of the Roman Empire, <clears throat> it was one of seven really strong cities. It was not anything like over in Palestine, the Promised Land. Rome had to constantly worry about what was going on over in Palestine. Rome had to constantly worry about what was going over in Gaul. Now that's France because problems were happening out there. But in Ephesus and in Asia Minor, which is right there where Ephesus is, uh, that and six other towns, they didn't have to worry about this city because this was a good city. It was a strong city. It was loyal to Rome in every, in every way possible. Uh, to the Roman Empire. It was an incredible city. In fact, in this city it had huge homes that were painted. Now folks, we paint our houses all the time. They didn't paint houses back then, folks. They were, they were mud. They were cut out brick. They were hardened brick that had been made out of mud and straw and stuff like this. Once they got those up or cut out of stone, once they got, they painted theirs because when people came to Ephesus, that port city, they wanted the people to look at them and go, ooh, ah. This was a city that had paved streets. That doesn't mean anything to us. We've got paved streets. However, there's some of y'all, if, if you can remember, you can remember going downtown Houston where they had brick streets. Brick streets before, paved asphalt and, and concrete streets. Folks, if you'd have been Jesus walking the Via Della Rosa, you were walking on stone. dirt. It was not stone back then. It was dirt. It was not paved in any way, form, or fashion. But in Ephesus, all the streets were paved. They'd been cut from stone. In fact, they advertised in the stone in Ephesus. The oldest advertisement in the world is an advertisement in one of the streets where if, you are, if a man was coming into that port and looking for a companion for the night, it advertised for you where to go. It's the oldest advertisement that's still out there that we, we know about. It was an opulent city. It housed the Temple of Artemis, which in that day and time was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was four times bigger than the Parthenon, one of the seven wonders of the world. It was a false religion that was a big, huge building. Guess what it also was? It was a bank. The religious Temple of Artemis was a bank. And cities and nations, as well as individuals, would go to the Temple of Artemis to make bank loans. That's the wealth that was in Ephesus. That's the way it worked. They had this Colosseum that would set 25,000 people. Okay, for those of y'all who went to the arena on our 40th anniversary, the arena will hold five, I mean 8,000 people. If you take off the four sections that we take off, it will only hold 6,000 because there's 500 in a section. If you put a stage and put the seats up front and take off 6,000, multiply that out. How big this arena had to be to have all the carts and the chariots and all the fighting and everything, to have 25,000 people. And they didn't have opera seats. They had pews. Actually, they weren't pews. They were rock stones that they built around that people sat on when they went to the Colosseum. 25, it was an opulent city. It was a luxurious city. They had everything that they needed. They had the best medical care. They had the best food. They had the best supplies. They had the best furniture. They had the best of everything. And in this city, Paul, on one of his missionary journeys, which we found in Acts chapter 19, he starts a church there in Ephesus in the home of, once again, 
our favorite church planting household, Pris Prisca or Priscilla and Aquila, who started also the church in Rome in their home. They have this church started in Ephesus, and it's going to be a strong church. And it is a great church, an incredible church. Well, 30 years after Paul writes this letter to the Ephesians, the Lord will tell John to write a letter to them. In the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 1 through 7, the Lord speaks to Ephesus. Let's catch up what happens 30 years after, because I want you to see, because it will tell us what's important in the book when we get to it. The, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write. That means to the pastor of the church in Ephesus. The, the messenger of the church in Ephesus. And what the a word angel means, messenger. And in this case, it's talking about to the pastor. Write to the pastor in the church of Ephesus. The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, say this. In other words, the Lord who holds, who walks among the seven lampstands, who holds the seven stars in his right hand. That's the Lord. He's going to say this. And if, you've, if you were reading this in your red letter edition, what I'm fixing to read to you would be in red. Verse 2. I know your deeds and your toils and perseverance and that you cannot endure evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not. And you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. Up to that point, we're a 30-year-old plus church in Ephesus and we have kept to the task. We've made sure no false preachers have come in, no false teachers have come in. We have persevered, we have toiled, we have been a church and we've kept being a church, the institution of a church probably because of what he's fixing to say. Verse 4, but I have this against you. Ooh, that's something you don't want the Lord to write for eternity in a Bible about you. I would hate for the Lord to say to Sagemont, but there's one thing that I have against you. Ooh, think about that. Think about what that would mean. And he says it here. He says, but I have one thing, I have a, this against you, that you have left your first love. They've left their first love. What was that first love? We don't know here, but we're fixing to find out when we get to the book because it's going to tell us what their love is. Verse 5 says, Remember therefore from where you have fallen. You've fallen from your first love and whatever it was about that first love. You've fallen for that and repent and do the deeds you did at first. In other words, get back to doing what you did at first when you were a church 30-something years ago. Now we just know that because we know when the book of Revelation was written. We just know that. He's saying, get back to where you were when you started. Do the deeds you did at first, or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of this place. In other words, I'm going to remove the corporate body of the church from this place in Ephesus. That's what the lampstand, that's the churches. That's the lampstand. I'm going to remove that from that place unless you repent. We can read on. History tells us, do you know what happens? Evidently, they did not repent. They did not return to their first love. They did not start doing what they had done at the first to become a great church. And even though they had persevered and toiled, that lampstand, the church, is there no longer. Interesting side note here. The church that was established on the island of Malta where Paul shipwrecked is still a church to this day. One of the oldest standing churches besides the church that Priscilla and Aquila started in Rome that has now become the Vatican and all that type of stuff, okay? But so we have that church in Malta that is still there all these days, all these 2,000 years. I mean, we can proudly have churches that put out, you know, established 1893. How would you like to have a sign that was established 34? <laughs> 34, you know, ought 34, okay, which ought 34? Church in Malta can do that. 37, 38, wherever it was. Paul says, look, get back to it. You've lost your first love. The book of Ephesians is important because 
uh, what it's, what's going to say to us is that the church is not an institution. It's not a bank. It's not a place to go make loans. It's not an institution to be part of. It is a, in fact, it's not even a building, folks. Folks, Sagemont Church could say, if we want to bring it home to this, we could say, guess what? It is time for us to move. And we could pick up bags and we can move eight, eight uh, miles down the road and Sagemont Church would be there. The buildings would be here. The buildings are not the church, folks. You're the church. But in that day and time in religious worship, outside of Christianity in false religions the church the religion was the building and where it was is a hold as an institution rather than thinking about it as a living body of believers joining together Ephesians 1 1 Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God you've seen this that happened this happened to Timothy we've seen this over and over and over he says to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus grace be to you, grace and peace from to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ it's a standard introduction like Paul gives except for he says this to the saints folks one thing I want to hammer home if you're a saint that means if you have your faith in Christ Jesus and you know that one day you're going to be and you have the hope and the, and the assured future that you're going to be in heaven. If you're going to be in Satan heaven, you need to be a saint here on earth too. You need to do what it takes to continue to be a saint. We had one aunt that we were taking care of. We always said, she's a saint. And she was. She was as good as gold. She was always good. She never did anything wrong. We had her sister, who our other great aunt that we were taking care of. And she was... Absolutely. <laughs> when they were walking home from school in Blair, Oklahoma, across the dirt roads, if there was a mud puddle, the good one would go around and to not get her shoes dirty, and the other one would just go straight through the mud puddle and stomp. And the good one would say, Marietta, you don't want to do that. You'll get in trouble. Just watch. And it was always that way. And they would tell us it was that way. And Marietta would say, she walked around the puddle. I walked through the puddle. And she was proud of it. It's just the way they are. Uh, if you're going to be a saint, you want to be a saint here on earth, folks. Christians need to be saints. We need to do what is right for people, showing that we belong to God. Ephesians 3, 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him from before the foundation of the world, that we should be the holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise and the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us, in the beloved time out what does that mean what an incredible thing it is to have the hope of a spiritual and a heavenly blessing just don't make anything more of this than what it is those of us 